Welcome to the lab. I'm Drew Collop. In today's lab, we're going to continue our carbohydrate identification series with Bar Freud's test. This is a test to identify monosaccharides. In each of these test tubes, I've added one mil of sample and one mil of Bar Freud's reagent. This is a reagent that contains copper 2 acetate in a dilute acetic acid solution. When heated, an oxidation reduction reaction will occur. This is the transfer of an electron from one chemical to another. Any monosaccharides in our solution will be oxidized. It'll lose an electron. And the copper 2 acetate will be reduced. It'll gain an electron. It'll become copper 1 oxide. This will create a red precipitate in the solution. This precipitate can be difficult to see, so I'll add 1 mL of phosphomolybdic color reagent to each of the solutions. Another oxidation reduction reaction will occur. The phosphomolybdic will be reduced and become dark blue in color. We have one potential issue with this protocol. It is in the boiling of our carbohydrates. If we boil too long, the disaccharides or polysaccharides will be broken down into monosaccharides. If that happens, you'll get a positive result for Barford's test. Here we have a hot plate with a beaker with boiling water. We have boiling chips inside to help regulate the formation of the bubbles when the water comes to boil. If you do not have the boiling chips, what will happen is the bubbles will form where the test tube meets the beaker. As the bubbles form, it can cause the test tubes to hop and sometimes spill some chemical outside the beaker. So always make sure you use boiling chips when boiling water. As you can see from the timer in the background, we're going to heat these test tubes for two minutes. The protocol I found stated to heat for a longer period of time. It's always important to optimize your experiments. So before I ran this, I did a time course to determine what the optimal time of heating these test tubes would be. Boiling more than two minutes led to the poly and the disaccharides breaking down into monosaccharides and resulted in some false positives, which is why I've decided to boil for only two minutes in this case. Notice some other items in this image. On the left, we have beaker tongs. When the two minutes is up, I will use the tongs to lift the beaker off the hot plate to remove that heat source. Do not use your hand. You could potentially burn yourself. On the right side, you can see another beaker. It contains water and ice. After I remove the tubes from the hot plate, I want the heating to stop. Therefore, I will transfer all the test tubes into the beaker of ice cold water. Again, if I do not stop this, the residual heat left over may break down those non-monosaccharides, polysaccharides and disaccharides, into monosaccharides, resulting in a false positive for Barford's test. Time is now up. Let's remove the beaker from the heat source. Now there's still quite a bit of heat in there. Let's stop the heating of our carbohydrates by transferring all of these test tubes into our ice cold water. I try and do this as quickly as possible to limit variables. The last tube that remains in there will be heated slightly longer than the others, and that is not ideal. We will then let this cool for two minutes before we analyze whether or not we have any precipitate in our tubes containing monosaccharides. Let's fast forward at 10 times speed so we're not sitting here waiting for two minutes. If you look closely, you can see some red precipitate in the bottom of a few of the test tubes.
Before we analyze the results, I would like to show you the time course I spoke of earlier. I heated maltose and glucose for different durations. Let's speak about glucose first. Glucose is a monosaccharide. Heating it for one, two, or three minutes resulted in the same results, a positive result for Barford's test, as expected. You'll notice, as we heat the maltose, maltose is a disaccharide of two glucose molecules. And as we heat it, it breaks down. At three minutes, you can see the solution starts to get slightly darker blue. At four minutes, it's quite a bit blue. And at five and six minutes, we get a positive result for Barford's test, exactly the same as we would for glucose. This is the reason I chose to heat the solution for only two minutes. The reason why these look so dark blue is because they've gone through the entire protocol. I have not added that extra color reagent to our unknown samples. Let's do that now. Here are the samples after cooling. And if you look closely, you can see perhaps that some of the solutions have a darker hue to them. This is that red precipitate found on the bottom of those test tubes. It's tough to see. So let's add in one mil of the phospho-molylibdic color reagent to each of them. Once that's added, it should be evident which have a positive and which have a negative result for Barford's test. Again, a positive result for Barford's test will be a dark blue color, and this will represent a monosaccharide in the sample. Once again, if you boil too long, those poly and disaccharides may break down into monosaccharides. Let's do that now and see how it worked. Negative control appears to be negative. Now maltose is a disaccharide, so should give a negative result. And yes, it appears we have a negative result for Barford's test. Glucose is a monosaccharide. You can see that red copper oxide precipitate reacting with a phospholiblic and creating that dark blue positive result we're looking for in Barford's test. Let's see the rest of the unknowns. One, now two. Sample three. Record down all your observations, not only the color, but anything that might be unique that can help you identify what the chemical actually is. Number five. Sample six. Unknown number seven. Number eight. Sample nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve, and our last unknown, thirteen. Here are all the samples. Let's take a closer look at each one to see if we can see any differences between the samples. Remember, some of our poly or disaccharides might be broken down into monosaccharides, resulting in a false positive. So when you make your observations, observe everything you possibly can. Here's our negative control. Another negative control for maltose, a disaccharide. And a positive control, glucose, a monosaccharide.
Sample 1. Sample 2. Sample 3. Sample 4. Sample 5. Sample 6. Sample 7. Sample 8. Sample 9. Sample 10. Sample 11. Sample 12. And sample 13. Now using the observations from Barfoid's test, the iodine test, and the Melosh test, try and identify your unknown carbohydrates. There are still two more tests we need to use to help assist us in identifying our unknown carbohydrates. In our next video, we'll do Balal's test, where we'll be analyzing whether something is a hexose carbohydrate or a pentose carbohydrate. I will leave the link at the end of this video. If you've enjoyed this video, give it a like and consider subscribing. Until next time.